pues buenos días, este, good morning, eh, les pido una disculpa por la tardanza, de veras es que me atrapó aquí el tráfico, este, I was stuck on the traffic, eh, but we are este, just starting, este, I am glad to, to receive here uh, David Jansix, uh, the author of the book that we are, we are coming, comment, com, commenting, uh, 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 to start, uh, uh, Elizabeth Perez from the CIDE will be, uh, will, uh, um, well, she will uh, comment the, the book. The next, uh, Alfonso at my right, uh, he comment uh, uh, at his time. And finally, David uh, will uh, close the commentaries. And then we will we, uh, open the, uh, to the public to, to make uh, the comment, comments or questions uh, at, at, his, at the wheel. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll start then with uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth uh, Perez Chiquez is assistant professor at the Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas Division of Public Administration. Her research agenda focuses on government corruption, public personal management, and policy implementation. Recently, she has developed work on corruption consolidation, corruption consolidation, local corruption networks, informal personal services, policy failure, and street labor work in environments of system corruption. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Okay. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I am thrilled to, to have read this book and to, to meet here uh, uh, the people working at ITESO. Um, so Oliver Mesa and I have been following uh, David Janchik's work, more or less, uh, for several years, and it has influenced our work and the work and, and the way we study corruption, precisely because of the of the big similarities that that we find in in the case he studies uh, in Hungary. So this book, I'm I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna speak briefly, and I'm gonna hi highlight three things that that really. Um, um, that, that, that I, I found really important for, for our work in corruption uh, and how, how we address it. Um, this book captures the, the complexity of, of, a, of, of the phenomenon of, of corruption. It is so complex that while, <laughs> while I was getting to the end of the book, I'm like, there's no way. Like, how can we deal with this complexity? He captures, um, he develops a, a, a typology of corruption, depending on who's involved and what is the, the resource transfer, and then goes so in depth in each of the chapters. So we see what's, what seems like market corruption and just a very simple thing is not that simple. Then we see how our relationships, how friendships, how different social bonds, how, and then it just gets more and more and more complex. One of the things that, that is wonderful about this book is that it highlights how corruption changes initially from, uh, he did ethnographic work for more than 10 years. It, it, it captures how it measures initially, like all these widespread corruption, police officers, everyone involved, everyone opening, uh, talking about it openly, and then how it, as, as the, the political atmosphere changes and the government becomes more authoritarian, how corruption completely changes and it morphs into state capture. So then, then there's no street level corruption, but there, the corruption that's present is so much more insidious and difficult to handle. And that's not what I wanted to highlight. What I want to highlight is the method. The ethnographic, he did more than 10 years ethnographic work in Hungary. And as a method to study corruption, I think maybe in, in the public administration, we look down upon it and we think quantitative uh, approaches might be best, but there's no way to capture these changes in patterns through other methods that, that are not immersing ourselves in, in, the, in, the, in field work. Um, so it's, 
uh, David writes about how he talked to friends, to family members, to like everyone he could. And that's something we should do because we have so much to learn from those around us, from ourselves and how we react to corruption, how we are involved in corruption. And that's the second point I think it's fabulous in this book is the focus on the clients, on those involved. So uh, he finds that uh, like social class, social groups are very important in how people interact with corruption. So some people do it because they cannot afford not to do it. It's the only way for them to survive. And then uh, like the middle classes, in this case, they, they like look down upon market corruption, like giving a bribe to a police, but they are fine uh, buying facturas and they are fine doing other stuff in their taxes or, in, or getting involved. But the rationalizations are so different for why these different groups are involved. So for me, it's like, wow, we have to think of ourselves. What am I comfortable with? What I, am I not comfortable with? To be able to address corruption in all its complexity. Finally, what I, uh, the, the last point I, I want to handle is the, the last chapter is on anti-corruption policy. And we had read work of David before on this topic. And he really goes more in specifics, providing more examples to, to drive in the point that, that one size fits all will not work. And it will not work here or anywhere. So we have to really first understand corruption in the way that he understands Hungary's corruption. We have to, to understand corruption, whatever it is we want to address it, and then design uh, anti-corruption measures that could actually, that, that can work. But, we, but how to do that, right? When it's so complex, where to start? What is more pernicious? What, because it's, it's um, um, so that's what the, the book left me with, like a lot of, of, uh, of reflection and the introspection of how, how, how do we, especially that, like how do the different groups where I live or where I want to address corruption are involved and what do they get out of it and why to, to try to, uh, but anyways, David, thank you for this, this fabulous uh, piece of, of literature and that's it for, from me. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, I, uh, you remember that uh, feeling that I had with, uh, when I start to, to re read the book. Uh, for me, it was like uh, reading a, a book of uh, Stephen King that terrifies me, but I can't uh, stop to reading because I, I saw that there is uh, too many things that are the same, or, 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 or apparently we're uh, in, at, at Mexico, we're following the, the same path. Uh, that's the, what, that terrifies my. But well, I I dating as the the, the it's, it's it's very interesting, and so I, I recommend uh, uh, to, to read the, the book precisely because uh, it has too many to to talk uh, in Mexico. Well, uh, next uh, uh, I'll give the word to to Alfonso Hernandez. He is a professor researcher at the Department of Sociopolitical and Legal Studies here at ITESUM. He is assigned at the Basic Academic Unit of Public Policy and Management. He was coordinator of the specialty in public integrity and anti-corruption strategies, and he also was member of the Citizen Participation Committee of the National Anti-Corruption System. His investigations were uh, 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 revolve around uh, transparency, accountability, and anti-corruption, uh, and also to uh, uh, around uh, federalism and democracy. Uh, thank you, Alfonso. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, well, uh, first of all, welcome to ITESO, David. It's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I say, salute both you, Alberto, and Elizabeth, and uh, I feel very, very honored to join uh, this table uh, with all of you to present this important book. I must say that uh, I like the book, the book very much. It is a very important book. It's a different perspective from the 
institutional debate on corruption, which I think is uh, very relevant. So when I was uh, reading the book, I had uh, so many ideas about the parallelism between Mexico and Hungary. And there are so many important concepts and uh, diagnoses in the book that I decided to write down my, my presentation because I get uh, more organized when I read than uh, when I uh, just put a few words in, in, my, uh, in my notebook. So I'm going to uh, divide my, uh, my presentation in two. First, I would uh, like to highlight some of the most uh, important ideas uh, of the book from my perspective. And uh, after that, I will uh, comment on a few uh, things that I, th that I think would be nice to do in a future research. I hope uh, they might be uh, somehow in, uh, insightful. Well, uh, first the highlights. Uh, the subject matter of David's book could not be more timely for Mexico. The parallels between Hungary and Mexico have to do not only with systemic corruption in both countries, but with the whole model of governance, which is actually what you uh, really say in, in your book. Of course, there are differences, but what we must highlight is the conceptual and diagnosti diagnostic richness in the public policy implications for controlling corruption that David establishes in this book for the Hungarian case and which are of great relevance for Mexico. I will begin by mentioning three aspects that, in my opinion, are the most important in the book. They are related to his theoretical and conceptual proposal on corruption, centered on a sociological perspective where the role of organizations plays a preponderant role. And I emphasize, I emphasize the latter, the role of organizations, because although they are important in the academic debate, they tend to be less discussed in the public spheres of decision making. First, David states that corruption should be analyzed beyond an individualistic approach, a mere transaction between an agent and a client. And with this, he moves away from the utilitarian and rational choice approach that prevails in much of the academic discussion on corruption. Instead, we should take into account the society and culture in which corruption takes place, which implies that corruption is a phenomenon in which context plays a very important role. But his approach is not one of cultural relativism, where there are as many perspectives on corruption as there are cultures in the world. His conception of corruption draws on the sociological tradition. In sociology, while the sociocultural context is important, so are the type of interactions that take place and the forms or structures within which those interactions take place. Second, this is one of the most important uh, points of your book, I think, and this is what I was referring to when I say that it is a different perspective from the institutional debate about rational choice and, and uh, utilitarian uh, ways to understand corruption. I think this is one of the most uh, precise ideas that you have in this book. The second idea is that under this approach, David expands the notion of corruption and clarifies what it is. A, it is an organizational phenomenon, not an individual one, and so organizational context matters very much. B, it is always conducted in secrecy. And C, it is influenced by power, since the actor's positions within an organization affect potential access to resources and thus social maneuvering. 
actually this this is a a, a very uh, nice idea when you confront uh, this sociological perspective on corruption and compare it to what political science has to say and i think the connection is uh, very important in terms of power and uh, you uh, we as political sci scientists sometimes uh, focus too much on institutions and not that much on power and the idea that you have about power in this uh, definition of corruption i think it's also very important and and a third third idea that i think it's uh, very relevant is this one the book establishes a new typology of corruption what elizabeth was uh, just saying and this typology is necessary in order to have a comprehensive understanding of this phenomenon it is based on two dimensions one the form of the transfer that is market exchange reciprocity or redistribution and two the primary beneficiary of the corrupt act that is an individual a social group or an entire organization and with these two dimensions in play the book proposes four types to understand corruption and it is what i like the most about the book this these four typologies, these four categories, which I think are very interesting to understand uh, corruption. The first one, market corruption. Market corruption is a one-time transaction typically involving the street-level bureaucrats and is captured in micro-level social interactions. The second, the second category, <coughs> I'm sorry, the second category, social bribe. Social bribe is a recurring activity typically using resources from the middle level of an organization and spreading across family, friendship, or local community networks. This phenomenon requires analysis that simultaneously considers the organizational and social context of the participants. Third, the corrupt organization. The corrupt organization type refers to cases involving collusion between multiple members within hier hierarchies of large organizations. This indicates that a meso-level perspective is required to reveal and understand intra-organizational dynamics. And lastly, state capture. State capture is a systemic form of corruption involving government elites, legislators, and powerful economic actors who redistribute significantly more resources than are exchanged in the first three types. Here, a macro-level focus on political institutions and inter-organizational structures is required. I think that, in a sense, all of these forms of corruption are present in Mexico, especially the first two. But I want to highlight the last two, the corrupt organization and state capture. In his book, David emphasizes that in a corrupt interaction, one should focus not only on the agent, but also on the client, that is, the beneficiary or bribe giver, especially when the client is the whole organization. He reminds us that organizations can be wholly corrupt. This is a situation that was prevalent in Hungary during the late 1990s and the first decade of this century. Then, in one of the most important findings of the book, we are told that Hungary passed from mostly market corruption and corrupt organizations before 2010 to complete state capture after that year and that corruption in Hungary has reached such unprecedented levels that politicians are cynical about the topic. They don't even try to deny it. Actually, this was one of your interviewees saying this, as, as I remember. With these ideas in mind, I will now uh, comment on a couple of issues where it seems to me that David could have delved a little deeper 
or where, he, or where he could go deeper in his future research. First, David divides the utilitarian school of corruption in two. The rational choice approach and the collective action approach. He says both are individualistic in nature, and I think he's essentially right. But here, David, I miss a deeper exploration of this last school. The reason is, the, is that the corruption as a collective action problem school has also taken into account the social and political context in which corruption transac transactions take place. And many authors have tried to bridge the gap between, between individualistic motives and sociocultural restraints, much in the way sociologists do. I am thinking especially, but not exclusively, on the work of Munhyu Pipidi, which you cite uh, very much, and others with regard to social orders and governance regimes. In fact, they emphasize the role of a social order to understand corruption. A social order is a regime composed of formal and informal institutions that structure the expectations and thus the interactions between individuals. And so a function is given to customs and cultural traits embedded in the population for understand, understanding cor <coughs> sorry, corrupt transactions. And second, and with this I finish my comments, there is a question that remains unanswered, which is worrying for both Hungary and Mexico because of the similarities that exist between the two countries. Why have the people in Hungary shown such strong support for the urban regime? characterized by virtually complete political capture of the state, and what implications does all this have for the unlikely, I'm sorry to say, return of a less illiberal democracy in Hungary? It is true that you tell us how the regime has silenced the press, neutralized the institutions that could represent a counterweight to executive power, and generally establish a complex web of complicity where the political and business elites have benefited from the systemic corruption of the Hungarian state. But all this, it seems to me, doesn't detract from the popular support for Orban. We see this repeated in many governments, characterized as populist, in nascent and consolidated democracies alike. And the question is why? What would you have to tell us about this particular issue for the Hungarian case? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfonso. <coughs> uh, I, I like the, the thing that, that do, do highlights, uh, especially the um, Typology of corruption. I think that is a very interesting thing to to reflect here in Mexico. And and, and I I'm not sure. I think that the state capture is is in progress in, 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 in just in this moment. But but well, we'll discuss that with David. Uh, David, este, could you please? Okay. Um, thank you very much for. Uh, for your very important comments and feedback. Uh, the, the book just came out uh, a few officially a few days ago. So these are the first feedbacks I'm receiving and I, I really appreciate it. And I also, I'm very happy to be here. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is my first time in Mexico. So I'm just, you know, I'm learning. Uh, yeah, this, is a, this is an amazing country. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the book. Uh, and I, so I will, I will do a little presentation and I will try to reflect to your uh, comments as well. Uh, first of all, the cover. Um, this is the artwork of Dr. Mariash. He is a contemporary uh, avant-garde artist. 
And uh, the title of this painting is uh, Lurins Mesaros Swallows the Matro Power Plant as a Word Cow in Franz Marc Studio. And it was in inspired by the original Word Cow painting uh, from Franz Marc, uh, and a German, uh, early 20th century German uh, painter. And, but if you see the, the face of this cow, it has a human face. And uh, that's the face of Lorenz Mesaros, and he is currently the richest Hungarian, or the richest oligarch. And his story is very interesting, and it symbolizes the whole system, <coughs> what's happening right now in Hungary. <coughs> Even 15 years ago, he was a small entrepreneur, uh, a gas pipe fitter, uh, a plumber, if you wish. And his net worth was about 50,000 USD. Uh, and he is from the same village uh, with Viktor Orban, and they were childhood friends. Viktor Orban is the Prime Minister of Hungary. And uh, the wealth accumulation in terms of scale and speed is unprecedented, uh, what happened with uh, um, Mesaros. So, again, 15 years ago, small entrepreneur, uh, 2022, he was named as the richest Hungarian with 1.1 billion USD net worth. And uh, the story behind the, the actual painting is also interesting. Uh, he's swallowing this power plant. So uh, 2018, he purchased this power plant for 6 billion Hungarian forints, about 13 million USD. And the next year, the Hungarian government uh, bought it back from him for 18 billion Hungarian, so three times more. And during that year, he accumulated a huge debt, and he basically took out all of the valuable assets from this plant. So this is how you can make really big money in Hungary within a year. So what happened in Hungary? I mean, once it was a very promising uh, ex-communist country trying to catch up the West, and uh, we did very well. Um, uh, we adopted all EU regulations, so on paper it's a well-functioning democratic country uh, with a good uh, market economy. And uh, we joined the European Union in 2004. And uh, after 2010 something happened. Uh, Viktor Orban came into power and he turned the country into an illiberal democracy. And it's very interesting because uh, TICPI, uh, Transparency International Corruption Index uh, s uh, says that uh, Hungary is the most corrupt European country. And uh, on the other hand, um, there's another survey, it's called Eurobarometer, and it's an annual survey, and it, uh, it is completed by ordinary citizens. And over the last 10, 15 years, it seems that fewer and fewer Hungarians uh, report personal involvement in corruption. So, in one case, corruption is going up. On the other hand, corruption is going down. So, what, so what's happening here? What is the reason of this discrepancy? And uh, I think uh, th these two measures capture two different uh, phenomena, uh, which means that uh, multiple forms of corruption coexist. And this is one of the main points of my uh, book that corruption is not one particular thing. Corruption has different faces, and it's it's worth to study them, uh, those different uh, types. Um, so, the book has three uh, main contributions. It offers a sociology of corruption, which is a mid-range uh, sociological theory uh, presented in the form uh, of a typology, and. Uh, I think building good uh, typologies is not an easy task because a typology should cover uh, as much as possible of that particular social phenomenon. Uh, um, but it should be simple. So it's very difficult to, f to, to develop a typology which is on, on the one hand it's simple, but on the other hand it covers a very complex uh, thing. Um, I hope I, I, I did a good job here, but I'm not sure, so I'm, we will see what other people will say about this. Uh, but I'm, I was trying to capture the social complexity of corruption with this typology, but I also wanted to develop something uh, which is applicable to different cultural contexts. And 
I'm very curious about your opinion about Mexico and the uh, comparison between Hungary and Mexico. Uh, so the book also offers uh, a, a rich uh, ethnographic uh, uh, data collection and data analysis, more than 100 uh, in-depth interviews between 2009 2022. So I collected stories, uh, re real life examples from people who participated in corruption or at least saw corruption very well around them. Uh, and I also used uh, a, a lot of uh, articles uh, published uh, by investigative journalists. Uh, they are very, they are very, uh, I'm, I think they know most about corruption. They know more than, uh, you know, academics probably. Um, and I also try to provide a corruption-centered narrative. So what, what's happening with, the, with those different types? How, how do they change over the time? Uh, the evolution of different corruption types over the past three dec decades, but with a, with a strong focus on the last 10, 15 years. Um, so... Um, so the utilitarian approach, uh, that's, the, that's the dominant approach. Uh, corruption is an exchange between only two uh, individuals, uh, rational actors. Uh, they are under-socialized, which means their social context is really not important in the story. Uh, and uh, this literature has a very strong focus on the agent side, what's happening on the agent's organization. Uh, they use a lot of principal agent dilemma. Uh, principal agent theories. So why is why why is it possible that the agent can be corrupt in his or her organization? Uh, and um, this approach says that corruption is the same ethically wrong, harmful act all around the world. Um, another approach, not as popular, but but also very strong. I call this the constructivist approach. Uh, so meanings and definitions of corruption are culturally, historically contingent, and corruption is an emic concept. This is from anthropology, so you have to go very close and understand uh, the motivation and the meanings uh, for local people uh, if you want to understand a phenomenon. Uh, and According to this approach, corruption is not necessarily a negative thing. It can be positive, it can be the weapon, uh, of the week, uh, it can be a survival tool, and there is a there is an ultra uh, relativist uh, wing of this approach, and they say that corruption does not exist. We have to use quotation marks because corruption doesn't exist; only the meanings of it. So my sociological approach is a little bit closer to this constructivist constructivist approach. Uh, I think corruption is complex. It's a uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it may have uh, social functions. Uh, it can be morally justifiable by, by the local actors. But there's one interesting thing. Corruption is always some kind of resource transfer. And if we focus on the transfer resources, we can find different patterns of corruption. And those patterns, those transfers are real. They are observable. Uh, so focusing on them, we can find the, find the general patterns of corruption, and uh, we should focus on that. <clears throat> My point of departure was Georg Zimmel, German sociologist. Zimmel said that all contacts among people rest on the schema of giving and returning the equivalence. So the main point is focusing on social, uh, social associations uh, and the forms uh, created by those associations. Uh, it's also called the, uh, the formal sociology or formalist sociology. Um, and my corruption, I, I don't want to repeat what you uh, already said, so corruption is an exchange, so the, it's a transfer of some kind of resources, it's an organizational phenomenon, because at least one actor uh, is in a formal organization, so it's not like street crime, right? So the, the occupation of the actors uh, uh, really matters. Uh, corruption relies, relies on secrecy, so it's a secret activity, and yes, p power matters because the, the actor's access to different kind of resources is, is more or less determined by their social status and their power in an organization. So we need to, we need to consider power as an important factor in corruption. Um, 
So I, I developed this uh, new typology based on two, two dimensions. Uh, I used Karl Polanyi's. Uh, Polanyi was a Hungarian uh, economic, uh, economic anthropologist. Uh, and Polanyi said there are, that there are three historical ways to transfer resources. The first one is market exchange based on pure uh, uh, economic motives. The se second one is reciprocity, uh, which has a, a, a logic of gift. Uh, it's a social phenomenon. The, the social aspects of the actors are, uh, are very relevant. And uh, the third one is redistribution. Uh, for this, we need a central authority. Uh, it can be a chief, a despot, a lord, a ruler, or more recently, it's a government. Uh, so a central authority is collecting resources and redistributing it. So it's a little bit different logic. Uh, um, the f um, yes, and the, the second dimension is the primary beneficiary, which is the client side. Uh, the client side is very neglected in the corruption literature, and I think it's very, very important to understand who are the people who who give bribes, right? Who are the people who are willing to, uh, to provide something uh, in return for an organizational resource? Uh, and it can be an individual social group or a whole organization. So this is my typology, the four types, market corruption, social bribe, uh, corrupt organization, uh, and state capture uh, based on these two dimensions. The first three are based on quid pro quo, some kind of exchange between two parties. Two parties doesn't mean we are talking about two individuals. There are multiple actors. Uh, whole social groups can be somehow involved. The, the fourth one is different because it's a re redistribution-based corruption. So for that, you need a central authority. And that's a little bit different phenomenon. Uh, and it's more complex. That's state capture. Very quickly, market corruption, dealing with strangers. So, so people in market corruption do not know each other, the client and the agent. Uh, it's usually a one-time transaction, an ad, ad hoc transaction. Um, the most typical example, which happens in, in Eastern Europe, uh, I'm sure in, in Mexico or probably uh, many other uh, Central Latin American countries, when a traffic police stops a driver, uh, usually for speeding or some kind of uh, um, violation and uh, there is a one-time transaction so in order to uh, let the, the person go you have to uh, in order to let you know to be allowed to go uh, you have to bribe the police uh, officer uh, it happens on the spot somewhere uh, you won't meet with each other in the in the future hopefully right probably <laughs> um, and um, so the social relation between the actors is not relevant here or uh, not relevant for, uh, for the utilitarian scholars. But uh, what I found is that the social status of the actors, especially the clients, uh, may be important to understand what's happening. So there are some uh, people from some social groups uh, who cannot afford to be corrupt. Uh, so corruption is unaffordable for them. Uh, usually I do not have enough money with the meat to bribe the police, so there is no risk that I would participate in corruption. Uh, there is also, there's also a social group, people who drive a lot, especially you know, manual workers, uh, who, who have to deal with uh, traffic police uh, and they have to know how to bribe them if they want to uh, keep their, their driver license. Um, also, there are some small entrepreneurs who are very good at this kind of corruption. They understand the situation. They know how to initiate a conversation about corruption. That's also a kind of risky thing when you have to deal with a stranger, a person who you don't know. Uh, so this whole, uh, uh, this whole uh, structure, how to start a conversation, what kind of language you should use uh, is very important here. And there are some people who are very, who, who, who have a lot of knowledge about, you know, how to do corruption. Uh, middle class, they, they don't like uh, get involved in corruption uh, in the street. Uh, partially because there is a status, authority, asymmetry. 
so they have a higher social status, but uh, the local authority has more power on the spot. But also police officers and those law enforcement agents, they usually have a lower social status. And because of this asymmetric situation, uh, no party uh, want to start a, a corrupt transaction. So middle class uh, usually use their own social networks, uh, for example, to delete uh, speeding records from the system. Uh, and there's a third, there's, a, there's another category, uh, the members of elite, they are basically immune uh, to, to be forced to bribe uh, police in the street. Uh, here's an example. Uh, then, uh, then just thank you and have a good trip. And he just released me because there was a stamp in the book, Ministry of Interior. So the members of elite, they don't have to deal with low level, street level corruption because of their status. Uh, the next one is social bribe, when people use their own uh, coexisting social network. So it's, uh, it's, it's based on uh, gift uh, logic, it's based on reci reciprocity, favoritism, nepotism, guangxi, uh, also blood, uh, comadrasgo, uh, those systems of mutual favors are very good infrastructures for this kind of corruption. I'm not saying that they are uh, fundamentally corrupt, uh, but when they exist, uh, they can be used for corruption. So this is based on reciprocity, helping friends, family members, neighbors, colleagues. Uh, it's coordinated by informal norms of the network. It may have a social function. Uh, first of all, it reduces the uncertainty because when you deal with a person uh, who is known to you, a friend uh, or family member, uh, there is trust in the transaction, and this is your this is your topic. So trust is very important because trust uh, reduces the the transaction cost of a corrupt exchange. But another social function is just keeping social groups together, just helping family members uh, to to maintain the social cohesion of your of your social group. Uh, it's based on trust. Uh, it also means that you can delay uh, the transaction. Uh, you trust the other person, so you don't have to provide immediate counter transfer, uh, the return. So you can reciprocate next year, you can reciprocate next month, it doesn't matter. Also the resource, the, the form of resources uh, can be very, very different. So I can give you a favor right now and you may help me with something else in the future. Uh, here are just a few examples. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, but the first one is interesting. So there is, uh, there is this economic part of the story of corruption. So you may hesitate to get involved just to get some benefits. But there's another thing uh, which overrides any moral inhibition uh, when it is about your family. I would do anything, anything, anything to help them, right? Uh, corrupt organization is also a very interesting, uh, uh, a very different type. Here, uh, corruption uh, benefits a whole formal organization, usually a corporation, a firm, uh, a private organization. So on the client side, we can find a whole formal organization. Uh, the most typical example is kickback for government contract. Uh, I'm sure it's very widespread in Mexico uh, as well. It was very widespread in Hungary. Um, Coordination is based on toxic culture, organizational culture, or sometimes it's enforced by power uh, from the executives. Um, so it's basically achieving legitimate goals for the organization, making profit, making money uh, by illegal means. Uh, some level of trust is needed between the partners. Uh, so what, what very often happens is that there is some kind of uh, official uh, business relationship between the two partners and once they know each other there is some level of trust after one year two years and then they decide to make actual money uh, because they trust in each other uh, this is also a top-down phenomenon because usually senior members uh, executives are involved uh, in the organization uh, the first example is very interesting so uh, um, an interviewee told me this. He wanted to put our product 
on the shelves of one of the biggest retail chains. Uh, he was crystal clear. If we wanted to bring our product in, he would, uh, he would need 5 million foreigns, about $25,000, in his pocket. After the meeting, I went to see the top executives in our company, and we made a rational business decision. We added this bribe cash to the cost, and it was still worth it. It also means that corruption may happen between two business organizations. Uh, it's not necessarily government involved. Uh, it's also called business to business corruption. And finally, state capture uh, is a very strange animal. Uh, again, it's based on redistribution. Uh, here, the laws and the regulations are tailored uh, to benefit particularistic interest groups. Uh, the state can be captured by business organizations. Uh, as we saw in Eastern Europe, the, those early, um, early 1990s, uh, we had a lot of oligarchs, uh, powerful business people who were able to capture some government institutions uh, and uh, uh, got monopolistic positions in, in some sectors of the economy. Uh, but the, the state can be captured by political actors as well, uh, which is happening in Hungary right now. Um, on paper, everything is legal because the regulations are all, all already tailored. Uh, so it is coordinated by normal hierarchical uh, coordination mechanisms, but also you uh, must have insiders in, this, in these deals. So it's also coordinated by an informal mechanism of clan control or patronage, patron-client relationships. Um, and uh, sometimes it's very complex, so those actors create very complex inter-organizational networks, including shell companies, including offshore companies, uh, to channel the money uh, using you know, different money laundering techniques. And uh, another feature of this is that institutions such as police, prosecution court, who should monitor uh, corruption, they are also captured or, or silenced by these uh, powerful political actors. So in Hungary, it's basically uh, systemic political state capture right now. Uh, in the 90s and early 2010s, uh, there were some powerful oligarchs who captured the state. Uh, but it was a kind of competition between them, so they, didn't, they never had absolute power to capture a whole uh, state inst institution system. Um, after 2010, uh, it became the, the main guiding principle of the whole national government system. Uh, so it's a shift, it's also a shift in uh, how the, the state redistributes uh, resources. You know, the classic welfare state redistribution uh, is less important than um, economic project-based redistribution because that's the way to extract huge amount of money from, from this kind of project. Um, it's also called, uh, Ivan Seleni called, this is capture of oligarchs by autocratic rulers, which means that the oligarchs are some kind of domesticated by uh, Viktor Orban and his cabal. Uh, so they either had to gi gi uh, give up their wealth or they had to play by the rules of Orban. So it's a kind of vertical uh, oligarchic system right now. It's very similar to what we see in Russia, for example, under Putin. The checks o on power are also neutralized. Um, and as we see, Orban's family members are getting uh, super rich. So here are just, just uh, some examples. Uh, the super yacht is owned by uh, Lorenz Mesa Roche. Um, that fancy apartment is $40 million in New York City owned by the son of the central bank, uh, a central bank governor in Hungary. Um, and the other two, uh, those are hotels owned by the son-in-law of Viktor Orban, um, the husband of his daughter. And these are, I mean, these are nice, expensive things, right? <laughs> so completely capture system as of 2022. Uh, so state capture is the dominant corruption form. It also means that uh, other forms of corruption are, uh, are not as important, uh, not as relevant, because the government actually fights against those forms of corruption. And it's, 
it's, it, it's going very well. So if you want to fight against corruption, you can. Uh, this is a very in interesting lesson here. So right now it's almost impossible to bribe uh, a traffic police officer or to, to provide uh, bribery to a doctor or nurses. Uh, but on the other hand, corruption is monopolized by the state. So only their corruption uh, is allowed right now in Hungary. And finally, uh, again, I mean, I created this typology, but there are so many other topics or sub-themes related to, to those types. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about them, but those are very interesting. Corruption brokerage, uh, when corruption is brokered uh, by a third party, uh, also related to Zimmel's uh, triad concept. Uh, the, sh the use of shell companies, so those shell companies in Hungary are not necessarily uh, offshore companies. It's, uh, there's a concept called uh, uh, domestic shell companies. And the main point is that the, those companies have an owner or a CEO, uh, the visible uh, actors, but they are not the real owners. So the real owners who can actually control the company uh, are behind the, the scenes. Uh, it's also related to the strawman or strawman phenomenon. Uh, again, the, the strawman is the visible owner, but he or she is not the real owner of the company. There are others behind uh, those strawmen. Uh, organizational aspects are very interesting, very important. Power, uh, corrupt culture or subculture, what's happening with the whistleblowers inside the organization, structural secrecy, because the organizational structure can provide some secrecy opportunity for corruption, uh, technicization, how to hide the nature of a corrupt transaction behind technical details, uh, contracts, uh, engineering details, uh, legal details, uh, how to deactivate control mechanisms inside an organization, how to ex extract money from a capture system, what kind of projects they use, uh, what's happening uh, with public procurement, for example, in Hungary. And there are some policy implications. So, uh, thank you very much. I think it was a little bit longer than I, I, I wanted. Um, this is my, my dog, Baloo, and we are promoting the book. Uh, so, if you, if you do a snapshot, uh, this uh, QR code can, and uh, you have to use that code as well, uh, and you can get a 30% off. <laughs> I'm like a, a traveling vacuum cleaner agent, you know? <laughs> trying to sell my product. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, David. And I, I, I apologize, but I, I forgot to present you. And so I, I'll do it in this time. David Jankic. Jankic. He's uh, an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs, where he teaches courses on administrative theory, organizational development, and research methods, among others. He received his PhD in sociology from the Graduate Center of the City uh, University of New York in, in 2013. Prior to joining the San Diego State University faculty, he taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, Justice and complete a postdoctoral fellowship at Rogers University in the School of Public Affairs and Administration. His general fields of interest are public management, organizational theory, and economic sociology. The more specific areas of his research involve corruption, informal practices, and white-collar crime. His current research agenda focuses on complex corruption networks. His work has been published on, in various uh, uh, academic outlets such as such as Public Administration Review, International Public Management Journal, Administration and Society, and Sociology Compass. Dr. Janchis uh, frequently consults with international organizations and NGOs, such as the United Nations, European Commission, EU4 Anti-Corruption Resource Center, and Transparency, Transparency International. His book, Social, Sociology of Corruption, Patterns of Corrupt uh, Exchange, in Hungary is the one we are commenting here. Thank you, David. And uh, I'm uh, very interested in the, in the uh, one uh, thing that you relate in the book that 
uh, the change uh, the, the, the of the people of the, uh, about uh, how to talk about corruption in, in 10 years. You to uh, write that uh, at the first time you will ask about how the people involved in corruption, uh, you, uh, you found that the people is, was uh, openly uh, talking about it, but 10 years later, uh, nobody wants to talk about uh, uh, what, uh, what's happening with uh, corruption. But well, that's one one question. But uh, I I want to uh, to to open the micro microphone to the the uh, assistants. No. Yeah, yeah. So let let me answer your question, and it's it's also related to your question. So what's happening in in Hungarian society? So this is a macro phenomenon, and and yes, when I started this research in 2009, it was right before the Orban government. Uh, um, and people were very open. Uh, I think partially because I lived in the United States. I was Hungarian, so they they knew that I, you know, they um, I was part of the country, the culture. But also they knew that I'm uh, I'm someone who's gonna who's gonna leave the country. You know, so someone who can be trusted because I'm not, you know, I'm not a kind of immediate threat uh, for them. So they were very open to talk about corruption. They many of them. Uh, allowed me to uh, record uh, the conversation, which was surprising to me. Uh, I was surprised. So I used the snowball te technique to find uh, more and more respondents, and it worked very well. And then uh, I continued this research 2010, 2011, and uh, people just started to be less and less talkative. It was harder to find uh, respondents. And even uh, if they were willing to talk, they were like, please do not record it. Please don't do this. So state capture is also the, a system of social control. By using these resources allocated at local level, uh, people are dependent on those resources, right? Those projects, uh, a small entrepreneur building roads for the lo local government, right, in a small town. Uh, and these kind of things. Uh, so their life depends on the resources coming from the government. And those resources are allocated al along political lines. So if you are loyal to the political system, uh, you can get some. Right? You can get some money. Uh, so people started to be you know, silent because they don't want to lose their job. They don't want to lose their projects and things like that. And, um, but also, still a lot of people support the urban government, surpri surprisingly. Uh, and uh, there are probably several reasons for that. But one, one reason is that people are disillusionized, uh, disillusioned, I'm sorry, disillusioned uh, by this, this new market economy, by the, by the new capitalist system in Hungary. So, um, 89, uh, 1989, the, the, the communist system collapses, right? Uh, huge expectations. Uh, every, everybody liked the West, you know, Western Europe, the United States. Um, and we hoped, it was, a, it was a lot of hope, we hoped that sooner or later, but sooner, eventually, we can have a, a nice capitalist country with a very high living standard. It never happened, never happened. First 10 years, no. We joined the European Union, no. What happened was we opened our market for multinational companies, uh, especially from Western Europe, but from all around the world. And those corporations, they are very effective. Uh, so they actually exploited Hungarian labor. Very low salaries, long work hours, uh, and the Hungarian labor force is, uh, is very good, very high quality, uh, very well skilled uh, uh, labor. And people hated working for low salaries, long work hours for those internationals. So what Orban promised was a national turn, right? Kick out those internationals, those Maltese, right? And uh, create a Hungarian, a national, uh, business class, right? Uh, a national bourgeois, bourgeoisie. 
And even the working class, even, even everyday workers, ordinary people, like the idea to, to work for a Hungarian owner instead of working for a French or German or Austrian owner. So that was very attractive for Hungarians. Uh, and those Hungarian companies provided even a little bit higher salaries. Um, so the whole idea to turn the country into a national uh, capitalist uh, system instead of a multinational or multicultural uh, system was very, very attractive for many people. And it, it's still uh, attractive. So people support the urban government and they don't mind if there is no, uh, you know, uh, freedom of speech or free press, they don't care too much. I mean, uh, intellectuals in Budapest, they do care. But people in the countryside, they just want a good salary, right? A good company uh, 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 to work for and, you know, nice career and that's it. Thank you. Uh, well, is, is there are uh, questions from the public? Are there? Oh. That's the. Hi. Uh, okay. I would like to, to know your opinion about impunity. In your four types of corruption, what is the, um, the role that impunity plays, in, in especially in Hungary? Because two years ago, I went, uh, I went there, and for example, I really surprised because uh, we found a, a guy that um, asked us $10 for skipping the line in Buda Castle, that is a beautiful museum and beautiful place, but well, I'm really surprised <laughs> that is what? Just for skipping the, the line? No, I prefer to, to skip the line, so thank you. Uh, it's not an easy question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think those kind of things are uh, market niches, right? Uh, and uh, there are people who can fulfill those niches, right? So I know that, you know, for example, uh, I'm not sure if it's the case right now, but years ago, to get a new passport uh, was a huge, you know, headache. Uh, you had to wait, I don't know, four or five hours, right? Uh, in a department uh, to do the paperwork, to do the, take the pictures. And, so there were people who were willing to do this for you for money, right? I think that's not corruption. I think that's just, you know, it's a market opportunity for people who are willing to, to stand in the line for five hours, right? It's very similar to your example. There's an app in New York, precisely that does that. Right, right. Well, I mean, there are um, Susan Rose Ackerman. Uh, she, it's her idea that uh, some forms of corruption can be curbed immediately. Uh, those tip kind of corruption, when uh, uh, when you create a, a legal or official way uh, to expedite the process, right? So instead of paying bribe to people who can expedite your passport issue process, you can, you can legalize it and, you know, even making more money for the government. Well, it, it has been very interesting to hear you, uh, David, and uh, it's, I guess you, your book is a call for a more interdisciplinary approach on the study of corruption that usually is being studied from other perspectives. There is one that is quite similar to yours. I don't know if heard your, it's true that you have heard of it, uh, the study of corruption as a collective action problem that actors try within endemic corruption environments to uh, find a way to access to, 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 to their needs. Now. There is a, a taboo topic 
uh, in corruption, and that is culture, because uh, when people use that uh, that reason or that 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 feature, it seems that it's impossible to have a solution for it because we have a cor uh, corrupt culture. Therefore, there is no way we can always uh, we, we we can evolve from it. Actually, uh, the previous president, which we thought would be the most corrupt in history, we were wrong, uh, had that uh, perspective that uh, culture is, is to blame for corruption. Uh, the thing is, how do you find uh, the, the, the degree of research on culture as a prone environment for corruption to exist? Because, of course, there is a lot of different kinds of corruption uh, culture has nothing to do with uh, corruption at high level where uh, really large companies come and trying to get the best uh, contracts. Uh, however, uh, I have always thought that dishonesty is like uh, in society could become a, a, a prominent feature that could help corruption to evolve. For example, in Mexico, uh, in the WhatsApp chats, people always complain about corruption. But sometimes those people who complain send uh, in the night the location of what we call over here the Torito, which is the authorities looking for drunk drivers in the night. So it's very strange that you can uh, be very critical of corruption while at the same time you're always also providing your friends and your social circle for a way to evade law. So. I don't know, I'm, I'm not very optimistic on Mexican society. Perhaps Eastern European society has a lot of features similar to ours. We were not under a totalitarian regime or authoritarian regime, but uh, it was a hegemonic uh, regime for quite a number of years. It seems that we are heading back, back there, I don't know, some sort of nostalgics or, or people who even never even lived it. But the thing is, I want to know what, what's your perspective on culture and corruption? Thank you very much. Yeah, this is a yeah, this is a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, of course, cu of course, culture uh, is a is a very very important uh, feature of corruption. It's a very important variable uh, to consider. And I think recently uh, scholars started to focus on culture more and more. Uh, started by anthropologists, but I think on now political science. I mean, uh, basically, uh, all disciplines consider culture as an important. Uh, element of corruption and of course there are different types of cultures right we can talk about national culture we can t talk about uh, a culture of an organization we can talk about a subculture within an organization we can talk about the, the culture uh, of our family right or our, our immediate social network uh, ha has strong normative influences right on our behavior and there are network cultures, for example. So Hungary is called the network culture, uh, and I'm sure Mexico uh, can be, a, a, right? So, which does not mean that uh, it's a corrupt culture. It means that we like to use our networks, our connections, uh, to get resources, to, to find a doctor, to find a, an expert of something, to find a good lawyer, right? Um, so we rely on those networks. Uh, which means those networks can be easily turned into corruption. And it also means there is a, there is a gray, gray zone, so there is not always clear, you know, what, what is corruption, what is not corruption. We're just using, you know, we're just helping friends, we're just helping family members. So where, where is the threshold? Where is the, where is the a clear line between uh, corrupt or not corrupt, or legal or not legal, right? So culture is a tricky thing, but also a very important element uh, when we try to understand corruption. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, from what you explained about the uh, the issue of corruption in Hungary, it, it seems that there is a 
wide social basis of support for such a regime. So I guess the policy implications are complex. Could you tell us more about what you think about what can be done? So what can be done against, uh, against state capture, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. Well, I think I think grassroots movements can be at some at some point successful. Of course, they can if if there is high level of support from uh, uh, from citizens to to vote for Orban every four years, right? The system is going to stay. But uh, I saw that some cases received a lot of attention from the public, uh, big scandals. And it was a little bit uncomfortable for the system. So, investigative journalism, you know, social movements, uh, pressure from the from the mass, from the from the citizens, uh, may work at some extent. But of course, it's not going to destroy the system. On the other hand, uh, the European Union just started to be a little bit more heavy-handed with with Hungary. Which is also surprising because uh, the system's nature was clear in 2011, 2012. And over these years, the, the European Union was kind of silent about that. Uh, partially because of uh, Germany, one of the most powerful countries. Uh, Germany has a lot of interest in Hungary, uh, economic interest. Uh, we have big Mercedes factories, uh, BMW, Audi. So it was not the interest of Germany to go against Hungary very seriously, beyond just the rhetoric, you know. Yeah, this is not good. But something changed in the last few years. So, for example, the European Union froze a huge amount of money, a, a grant uh, for Hungary, supposed to be given to Hungary. 20 billion euros, big money. But, uh, so, the answer, in t international pressure or pressure from this kind of, you know, uh, international institutions uh, uh, may work. So, in return for creating a new anti-corruption agency and all of, the, you know, new legislations, blah, 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 uh, Hungary received some money. And also, in return for letting Ukraine receive the grants from the European Union, Hungary also received one, 10 billion of these 20. So, meaning it's also part of this horse trading uh, at Euro EU level politics, right? So they are, I'm not sure if they really want to curb corruption in Hungary, they, they, but it's very, you know, convenient to use this kind of tools to to get something from Orban they want. Hi. Mr. Miriam. Hi, um, I have a question. I haven't read the book yet, so my questions are about uh, the things that I heard today. Um, my question, I have it here, is um, how the state capture form of corruption is similar or distinguishes to other concepts or forms such as plutocracy or corruption plutocracy? And also about the last question, or it has to do with that. What is the discourse or the narratives uh, from government of officials or politicians about corruption or anti-corruption policies? And what is the social response to this? I think that you mentioned that there are like cynic, um, as in Mexico, <laughs> but uh, if you can, um, talk about that. Thank you. 
partial state capture in local governments. So in, in Budapest, some districts were captured by very powerful mayors, for example, or, or some uh, countryside or smaller town governments uh, were also captured by powerful actors. Uh, it was a company, the Budapest Transportation Company, which is a huge, uh, that company provides all services, bus, uh, metro, subway, train, uh, for Budapest, big, very, very big company, was also captured by one CEO, for example. Uh, I think the, the difference is that, y yes, I mean, we have those captured local systems, but if we have a strong, uh, national level, uh, we have checks and balances, right? If we have, uh, we have uh, independent prosecutors, we have independent police, uh, those, those local capture system, uh, systems are not defendable for, uh, for a long time. Um, and this, we have several examples uh, uh, from Budapest when uh, it was a huge public pressure, you know, it was highly publicized by investigative journalists, uh, so the police had to, you know, start an investigation, even if they were reluctant to do it, you know, eventually they had to. And then uh, they were able to, to stop uh, those, ca you know, local captures. When it's, uh, when it's complete, you have no institutions fighting against it. You have no, you know, no prosecution, no police. Uh, Nothing inside the government system willing to fight, willing to fight, no, no. Um, well, some judges are still independent, so the, the ju judicial system is partially independent in Hungary. So we have, but if, if the case is not investigated by the prosecutor, well, you know, right?